Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SCA's 42nd monthly Zoom presentation. We're now halfway through our fourth year with no end in sight. My name is Brian Gallagher, and I'm the Vice President of the Society for Commercial Archaeology. I will be your host tonight. Welcome to all our guests and any new people we have with us tonight. We're welcome you took the time out of your late autumn evening to watch an SCA presentation. I hope you enjoy the show. Sorry, I keep saying evening, it's actually afternoon for most people. And for anybody watching the recording of this episode of the SCA's monthly presentation, who is not a member of the SCA, we earnestly ask you to consider joining. Funding for the various uh, activities of the SCA comes almost exclusively from our membership. Just visit our website at www sca-roadside.org and follow the links. Now I have the pleasure of introducing today's presentation. Dr. Kara Rodway, Head of Research Development with the British Library, will delve into the motivations driving the remarkable surge in the American motel sector in the first part of the 20th century, evolving from experimental beginnings in the 1920s to an established industry in the 1930s. We will explore why motels <clears throat> excuse me, thrive during this era, shedding light on business strategies and shifts in consumer preferences. Additionally, we will explore who is staying in these motels and what this can tell us about social change during the period. We'll also consider what meanings the public attach to motels and why, and what this can tell us about American culture and values in a time of rapid social and economic change. Dr. Rodway holds a PhD in American Studies from King's College London. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her research centers on 20th century US social history, popular culture, and the formation of identity. Kara is the chair of the British Association for American Studies and is also has also served as secretary of HOTCUS, which is the historians of the 20th century United States. She has worked in cultural affairs at the U.S. Embassy in London. She has also worked at the Imperial War Museum. She is currently Head of Research Development for the British Library. So without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Rodway to come uh, on screen and give us her presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. I hope everyone can hear me. Can you give me a thumbs up? Yep, Make sure it's good. we can hear oh, you. Good. Can hear you. Okay, I'm going to start uh, sharing my presentation. Fantastic. I hope everyone yeah, that can looks see good. That. We can see it. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you uh, so much to the Society for Commercial Archaeology for having me today. Uh, it's really lovely to have the chance to uh, to meet a range of, of new colleagues um, and to have a chance to talk with a really knowledgeable and enthusiastic uh, audience. A particular thanks uh, to Emily um, for the original invitation uh, and to Mike and Brian for their help in putting the session together. So as that introduction suggests, uh, I'm an, uh, a researcher of American uh, cultural history. My doctorate, many years ago now, was uh, focused on post-war motel development. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, lodging is just a fascinating topic. Uh, obviously, travel really brings social change into stark relief. You move people from their, from their regular place of comfort and put them somewhere new and all kinds of interesting things happen. Uh, I was really drawn to motels as uh, places that are liminal, that are kind of neither one thing nor the other. They're very much uh, kind of on the um, on the margins. Uh, and I was really also interested in the kind of quasi-domestic element uh, in, in motels and how kind of when that sort of quasi-domestic element was mixed with the destabilizing qualities of travel, um, and especially the sort of anonymity associated with motels, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I was really interested in how uh, meaning was then generated in the motel space. So my doctoral research looked at a variety of sources um, from women's memoirs of motel management, uh, travel guides for black drivers, um, fiction and film representations of motels, um, all through the post-war period, so from the end of World War II uh, up until Psycho, I often joke was my sort of end point. Um, and I'd be really happy to pick up any of those sort of post-war topics uh, in, in question and answer. 
But this project has uh, emerged out of that doctoral research, and this is something that I've picked up on and off uh, kind of over the years. Um, I'm not a full time academic. I work uh, in what have, uh, we, at least we call in the UK an alt ac um, a career. I work in, in the British Library. I spent nine years in the American Studies Research Centre at the library um, before moving into my, my current role. So I've, as I say, I've picked up this, this project kind of on and off. So I'm very, very interested to, to, to have a chance to share it with you today. Um, and I was really interested in thinking a little bit about the expansion of the motel sector in the interwar years. Um, as Brian said in his introduction, looking at the 20s as a period of experimentation um, into the 1930s when the industry comes of age. And the things I've been thinking about is, you know, why did motels flourish in this period? And what does does that tell us about the business, um, but also um, about developing consumer habits? So who was staying in these motels um, and what can this tell us about social change happening uh, in that interval period? And what meanings did the public attach to motels and why? Um, and what could this tell us about American culture and values in the period? So as many of you may know, this is a very fluid uh, period for terminology for these spaces. I'm going to use motel kind of throughout, which um, is, uh, is not strictly accurate when you look at the period and other terminology will come in. I use it mostly because I think people now sort of know what it means, a sort of place of roadside lodging. Um, but obviously through this early period, you get camps, courts, cabins, cottages, uh, and motel really isn't the common designation in this period. It's really, I'll talk about the origins. Um, and as a term, it really had to beat out other designations to become preeminent by the 1940s. Um, hotel, as in automobile hotel, uh, was one that was uh, that was around for a bit in the period. Um, but I often uh, think that it was probably a bit too French sounding uh, to have caught on. So what did the lodging landscape look like in this period? And what meaning was tied up in the previous forms of lodging and how did that uh, play out in the new spaces of the interwar roadside. So the terminology can sort of provide some useful clues but first we uh, can have a think about what was there, what were there before, what were the options for travellers um, say in the sort of early years of the of the 20th century so through into the uh, sort of post-World War I period. So you have as represented by the top two pictures, sort of smart downtown hotels, um, also uh, sort of similar in scale. You'd often have railroad hotels and then uh, represented at the bottom, you'd have um, spaces like drummers hotels or commercial hotels and tourist homes, which were very common um, in the East. Uh, and these all these spaces sort of, you know, were serving different markets. You would have um, Big hotels were, were, were very, often very formal spaces. Um, tourist homes were, were were less formal, but obviously, as I suggest, you were staying in somebody's in somebody's house. Um, and but it's quite interesting to sort of think about um, the sort of gendered nature of some of these places. So obviously, commercial hotels particularly would have been very male, as sort of filled as they were by business travel. Um, whereas uh, if you moved away towards, say, resort hotels, so sort of say coastal um, or sort of lakeside uh, places, places associated with leisure and tourism, these were often much more uh, female or family centered. Um, but particularly if you if you were traveling in urban areas, um, your choices uh, were, were very much kind of expensive, uh, large hotels, uh, or um, particularly depending on where you're traveling, smaller uh, auto camps, uh, sorry, smaller tourist courts. Uh, and then the, the final, the black and white image there is, is to represent um, camping. And so this is another sort of significant context really for this period. So auto camping, um, as it was known, uh, which is simply going camping with your car, uh, was in vogue from the teens. It was also referred to as gypsying um, and this idea of sort of getting off the beaten track and back to nature. Um, if you think of the sort of national parks movements happening um, around the same time, so these tourists and travellers were, were, were keen to get away from the strictures of railway timetables, um, you know, where you could only you could only go where the train was going. And at the time, the train wanted to go there and also the formality um, of, of hotels. And so to service these these travellers, you had free municipal camps um, were set up by um, by local authorities, um, local governments uh, really aiming to attract tourists 
in the teens and early 20s. And the, but these free camps really started to give way to pay camps. And it's interesting to think about how the democratic ideals that were wrapped up in this vogue for camping. So getting away from stuffy forms of tourism. Um, the promoters saw the camps as freeing and refreshing. Um, but many of these discussions have implicitly saw the appearance of upper class travellers as the marker of success and sort of cultural approval for the movement. Poor travellers who needed to stay in free camps due to economic necessity were often sort of termed a menace um, and rather than you know, perhaps being symbols of a successful democratic experiment. And many municipal camps struggled to handle volumes of travellers with facilities becoming sort of unsanitary and overcrowded. And as I say, undesirable, uh, inverted commas, residents uh, being considered a problem. And in the mid 1920s, many municipal camps closed or were given over to private managers. And the arrival of private camps really heralded the beginnings of the motel industry as owners began to add rudimentary ca cabins, which became increasingly sophisticated. And so the typical story of the development of the motel industry sees a clear teleological progression from camps to cabins to cottages uh, before exploring uh, the industry as it came into its own in the 1930s. So it's really interesting, I think, to look at a few examples from the 1920s when experimentation in the sector offers a window into how Americans were beginning to understand travel and their relationship to automobility. So the first use of the term motel is generally agreed to be in California uh, in 1925. So local real estate developer Arthur Heinemann, who regularly traveled the state for work by car, conceived of a chain of accommodations throughout California designed to meet the needs of motorists, uh, which he felt were primarily uh, good access, you know, good road access and free parking. And he developed the concept with others in his firm, as well as associates from the Automobile Club of Southern California. And in June 1924, the Milestone Interstate Corporation was incorporated, with the board including a hotelier, a financier and a restaurateur. So the original plan was for a chain of 18 motels from San Diego to Seattle, with each one located approximately 150 to 200 miles apart, uh, the milestone, as the name suggested, um, at the end of each day's drive. San Luis Apispo, between San Francisco and Los Angeles, was chosen as the first site. The company's promotional brochure promised that motorists would enjoy, quote, not only the scenic beauties of the open road, but all the comforts of his own home while away from home. It's interesting to note here that Heinemann and his brother specialised in domestic real estate development, and they're really noted for their work in developing bungalow courts in Southern California, an architectural form which heavily influenced motel design in the uh, 1930s and 1940s. So the first incarnation, which you can see on the side, was named the Milestone Motel. Uh, but law has it that after the billboard announcing the project at the development site went up, the sign, marker, sign maker started receiving calls informing him that the word hotel had been misspelt on the sign. According to Arthur Heinemann, they realised that people weren't ready for the new term and his advertising consultant suggested adding a hyphen, so M-O hyphen to E-L. The second owners of the business in the late 20s changed the name to the Motel Inn and designed their signage so that the first letter alternated between an H and an M for clarity, which is what you can see represented in this postcard. And journalists reporting on the new project uh, were quick to link the motels to the historic Spanish mission buildings, which were an important part of tourist trade nostalgia in Southern California. A Los Angeles Times article described this, quote, hostelry chain for motorists with the subtitle, Motels is the new caravansary is the name for new caravansary system. The Milestone Motel itself made use of Mission Revival architectural motifs. For example, the tower on the main office building was a direct quotation of the terraced Campanario at the, San, at the Mission in Santa Barbara. And just as the railroads in the region in the late 19th century had drawn on this historic nostalgia, so too did this new building form devoted to a new form of transport. Nostalgic motifs proved to be an important part of motel design in the 1930s and 1940s, and the milestone was an early pioneer in this regard. So where Heinemann and associates saw the growing need for new types of accommodations from the perspective of the user, other businesses saw the huge potential in serving motorists because their existing business already did so. Whilst many small gas station operations on rural or suburban roads started to add camping accommodation, some larger businesses started to see larger scale possibilities, which say much about corporate confidence in the 1920s. 
The Pierce Petroleum Corporation opened two Pierce Pennant terminals on routes 40 and 66 in Missouri in 1929 to serve tourism to the Ozarks region. These each consisted of a 40 room hotel with private bathrooms, a terminal building housing a 154 person restaurant, a luxurious restroom for women, lavatories, a soda fountain lobby, a dining room for chauffeurs, a free emergency hospital and other departments, and a filling station and garage. The women's restroom was in a French Renaissance style, quote, its decorations in sharp contrast to the colonial simplicity of the soda fountain lobby, whilst the luxurious hotel rooms featured deeply upholstered chairs and thickly carpeted floors, along with French telephones, steam heat, and electric wall fans. So obviously these facilities were in a scale far beyond that seen in the Milestone Motel. And although deliberately fancy, the range of facilities echoed those eventually seen in many successful motels in the 1940s and 1950s, albeit without chauffeur's facilities. In the summer of 1930, shortly after National Petroleum News carried its extensive puff piece on the Pierce terminal system, sociologist Norman Hayner and his wife, touring the evergreen playground of the Northwest, reported that, quote, the physical equipment provided in the auto camps on their tour vary from one item, faucet with running water, in a free forest camp, to the comfortable furnishings in a $2 wayside apartment described as follows in the diary of the trip. The main room was equipped with a good bed, the bedding could be rented for 50 cents if desired, chairs, mirror and clothes closet. The kitchen was a separate room with an excellent wood cook stove, running hot and cold water, sink, cupboards, table chairs, dishes, cutlery, cooking utensils, and even a line for hanging up dish towels. The bath was also a separate room and included a flush toilet, wash bowl, mirror, hot and cold shower. The walls were plastered, the windows attractively curtained, and there was linoleum on the floor. The Pierce terminals, ahead of their time, became an expensive failure. What the public really wanted during the Depression was the kind of facilities noted by Hayner and his wife. A highlight of writing about the roadside in this period is James Agee's unsigned article, The Great American Roadside, which appeared in Fortune magazine in mid-1934. Uh, Agee neatly summarised the options open to drivers. So this is a long quote, but it's a good one. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it up and I'll read it through. It's six in the afternoon and you're still on the road, worn and weary from 300 miles of driving. Past you flashes a sign, deluxe cabins one mile. Over the next hill, you catch the vista of a city, smack in your path, sprawling with all its 10,000 impediments to motion. It's unmarked routes, it's trolley cars, it's stop and go signs, it's no parking markers. Somewhere in the middle of it is a second class commercial hotel, whose drab lobby and whose cheerless rooms you can see with your eyes closed. Beyond around the corner, eyes still closed, you see the local Ritz, with its doormen and its bellboys stretching away in one unbroken, greedy grin. <clears throat> you see the loading of your car as you stand tired and cross, wondering where you can find the nearest garage. Your wife is in a rage because she has an aversion to appearing in public with her face smudged, her hair disarranged, and her dress crumpled. All these things and more you see with your eyes closed in two seconds flat. Then you open them, and around the next bend, set back amid a grove of cool trees, you see the little semicircle of cabins which the sign warned you of. You pull in by a farmhouse, or a filling station, or a garage, which registers instantly as the mother hen to this brood. The cabins, such as those invitingly described by A.G., represented new architectural and social spaces. Whilst many had indeed developed from little more than rough wooden sheds, sometimes made from converted farm facilities, such as beehives or chicken coops, as their detractors were ready to point out, motel owners were quick to see that the motoring public were happy to leave camping equipment at home and pay extra for increased conveniences. But it was not a sure path to self-contained privacy. In the early 1930s, a high proportion of camps still contained communal spaces, such as shared toilets, bathrooms, kitchens, and wash houses. For many travellers, these reminders of the spirit of gypsying added to the appeal of the roadside. A warm 1934 review of roadside accommodations in the New York Times Saturday magazine, entitled America Hobnobs at the Tourist Camp, described the communal shower arrangement, noting, quote, Baths more luxurious are made, no doubt. But listen to Mr. Texas, happy man, splashing and blowing like a walrus. 
what bath the prince or plutocrat could better wash away the dust of travel and prepare the traveller for blissful slumber than this crude machine at Shady Oaks. There was a heavy degree of romanticism in these accounts, <clears throat> and the democracy of the road was always circumscribed. Ooh, I'll just think of the exclusion of non-white travellers, for example, or of the introduction of fees at municipal camps to keep out the homeless. Although there was indeed a degree of social mixing, Nevertheless, the emergence of the motel demonstrates that roadside entrepreneurs grasp the business possibilities. As A.G. pointed out to his fortune readers, quote, it may never have occurred to you that the great American roadside is incomparably the most hugely extensive market the human race has ever set up to tease and tempt and take money from the human race. So it's worth reflecting, I think, a little bit on what the economic underpinnings of the tourist camp business were. Uh, so the cabins were um, cash based. This is obviously, you know, was a made entry quite accessible. You didn't need to take out loans to um, in order to get started. There was a lot of potential for uh, recycling. Uh, you, yeah, as the pick and coop sort of <laughs> stereotype goes, you know, people could reuse um, materials they had, say, on on the farm. Also, there was a lot of opportunity for seasonal redevelopment. So, you know, you could plough any profits from, say, the summer season um, into redevelopments in the quiet season to be ready to welcome more guests, say, the following summer season. And similarly, that kind of uh, ability to to respond to customer need, that flexibility um, was a really successful sort of mark of the business. You, you weren't throwing up a massive hotel and then being stuck with that number of rooms and that number of staff, you know, forever more. You could... Um, yeah, you could take things down, you could add multi-room cabins, you could do all kinds of things. Um, and that being able to be flexible and have, you know, something that goes from a very basic offering through to a slightly fancier offering meant that you were catering to a whole range of, of um, visitors. And as I mentioned earlier, obviously, a lot of these were add-ons to existing businesses. So that was a, you know, was another way to, you know, that each business could support the other. And a big marker of why a lot of these businesses were cheap to run was that they utilised family labour. Um, so you might have um, you know, the husband doing all the repairs. You might have the wife running the, you know, the uh, reception area, doing the cleaning, the changing the beds. You might have children involved in housekeeping. Um, these were very, uh, yeah, were very cheap to run because you didn't have to pay a large staff. Um, and also a lot of these took advantage of low land prices. So, um, you know, on particularly say in rural areas, uh, you know, this was inexpensive space to use. And so as, um, as we've seen, the business really flourished in the depression, but it wasn't a product of the depression. It really followed underlying trends going on um, beforehand. Um, an obvious, most obvious one obviously being car ownership, which um, from really the 1920s just uh, it skyrockets uh, in the US. And also travel patterns. So, you know, there's a lot of um, business travel um, and things which is being uh, supporting these um, businesses. But nevertheless, the Depression uh, did offer new opportunities. As the Literary Digest noted in 1934, quote, one of the few oases of the Depression, this business has thrived on hard times and limited purchasing power. Americans refuse to sacrifice their motor vehicles to economy. And while rail travel has suffered, the number of automobiles in use has held up steadily. While nation business observed that, quote, even the depression with its toll of unemployment and deflated pocketbooks has failed to dampen America's interest in travel and its annual vacations. So these stories provided an uplifting message that capitalism still worked and that Americans could still find ways to stay true to the country's democratic origins by mingling with their fellow citizens on the road. As more Americans chose to drive, more entrepreneurs began to offer accommodations. So oversupply and turn meant businesses were required to continually improve their offerings in order to keep customers. And these improvements in turn attracted former hotel patrons looking to save money, but who required good quality accommodations. An important market for maintaining the buoyancy of tourist courts were traveling salesmen. As the depression bit, expenses budgets were reduced and cabins became a necessity for drummers who had previously stayed in commercial hotels. Alongside the price, many may have appreciated the homely atmosphere cultivated by camp owners. 
As repeat customers with extensive networks, they were an important factor for local moteliers and formed uh, the economic backbone for many businesses. And middle class drivers and women in particular, particularly appreciated home comforts. Unlike the male atmosphere of commercial hotels, cabin camps displayed distinctive sort of woman's touch. They had uh, chintzy curtains, your doilies on the dresser, rockers, flower boxes. Whilst most of the original cabin improvements catered to auto campers who wanted to take less camping equipment, the changes also attracted non-campers who discovered the advantages of easy access, free parking, no reservations, no clerks, no ticking, informality, home-like atmosphere and fresh air, which was all in stark contrast to, for example, the railroad hotels. As owners looked to differentiate themselves from the competition, facilities improved. Private baths were added, carpeting and telephones installed. Such features were not standard in the domestic market. So for many travelers, tourist court stays were their first exposure to such features. Marketers for national brands keen to look for new opportunities in an economic downturn realized the opportunity presented by the developing motel industry and began to market their products to motel owners. And travelers in turn look to nationally known brands such as Simmons Beauty Rest Mattresses as a way of navigating the local vagaries of individually owned roadside accommodations. Um, so um, motel owners would advertise which particular branded products you could uh, experience at their motels and Simmons Beauty Rest Mattresses were a, um, a popular one and so that was something that you could look for as you were driving um, and you would know that that was a standard um, yeah, you know, much as much as all standardized, um, you know, marketing uh, helps you know what you're going to get. And so thus, uh, drivers entered a consumption community which crossed regional lines and helped them to feel at home on the road, wherever they happen to be. And building design is also an interesting element in this regard, embracing two broad areas of meaning. On the one hand, many tourist courts harness domestic imagery, such as the aforementioned doilies and window boxes and carried it through to building cabins in the bungalow style, which resembled many houses found in residential neighborhoods in the period. The other important factor in building design were, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, historic or regional motifs. So it wasn't uncommon to find Dutch or colonial style courts in the East or log cabins in the North um, or West, while Spanish uh, colonial and mission revival were popular in the Southwest. Uh, the wigwam chain of motels are some of the most memorable in this regard um, and possibly some of the most well known and they found modest success in the border south these historical architectural quotations allowed travelers the opportunity to sample the regional past uh, from within the comfort of modern car-based uh, travel and this sort of complex relationship with history was most visible in this period by the 1950s the industry had by and large thrown off such historical associations and positioned itself as thoroughly modern and forward-looking. Yet, while improvements to the physical environment in the 1930s raised the profile of the tourist court business and attracted a new class of guests, these businesses continued to trade on their folksy origins and status as small mom-and-pop businesses, um, you know, often seen in um, you know, folksy spellings of uh, place names, that kind of thing. Observers credited these factors as a major reason for the industry's success, and reportage often used language that highlighted this background, for example, Agee's description of the mother hen and her brood. Linking back to America's pioneer past, other commentators described the industry as growing civilized in this period. For example, a 1935 New York Times article was entitled Motor Camps Win New Friends. Evolving from a primitive shack, the 1935 model achieves beauty and modernity and has spread from coast to coast. Similarly, journalists noted uh, the individualized service which guests received from small owner operated, uh, from small owner operators, or what was described as the deserving old couples and deserving young couples who make up a large proportion of those who run overnight camps, as one article put it. In an era when the image of big business had been badly dented, these small businesses linked to national myths of individualism and hard work, narratives sorely needed in Depression America. The connection which the tourist courts had to an older history of camping also continued to be emphasized in reportage, often with a romanticized view of the democratic nature of road travel. L.H. Robbins' New York Times Saturday Magazine piece from 1934 
observed that, quote, the morning light reveals that all kinds and conditions of Americans have taken refuge here. They represent the sturdy yeomanry of the land and the beauty and chivalry as well. The portly tenant of Hut 9 has the look of a banker, and the undernourished chap next door appears to be a drought-stricken farmhand, or perhaps an author. But despite this rosy view, it was the appearance of the possible banker at the tourist court which was cause for comment, and the industry worked tirelessly to cultivate these customers, even when they brought assumptions with them about service levels or price, for example, which jarred with the owners. Clara Keaton, who ran a camp in Arizona with her husband from the mid-1920s onwards, observed in her memoir that many affluent tourists took advantage of hard times while the legitimately indigent camped by the roadside or stayed at home. <clears throat> Quote, Some managers thought that with the depression there came a cleaner, better class of tourist. I grant the cleaner, but I doubt the better part. There was less of drunken parties and riffraff. I felt that I could stand a little more dirt and less of grouching and miserliness. As motel historian Warren Belasco noted of this period, some of the wealthy tourists bargained for sport. Indeed, this opportunity ne to negotiate endeared the roadside to some travellers. The camp seemed so democratic, partly because it was so cheap. As the quote from Clara, Ke Kate Clara Keaton makes clear, excessive bargaining was not the only misbehaviour that owners had to look out for. Other forms of immorality also provided headaches. The privacy afforded by cabin camps, especially when considered next to the formalities of hotels, proved attractive to what was known as the couple trade, or more descriptively, the bounce on the bed trade. Whilst many enemies of tourist camps, notably the hotel industry and many of its proponents keen to encourage a clean image, were ever ready to decry the moral decay encouraged by tourist camps who catered to this trade, for many business owners, it was a necessary part of their income. If couples only wanted rooms for short periods, the same space could be sold many times over. And given that many of these couples were locals, this income stream, could prove invaluable during the off season when tourist numbers slowed. In the mid 1930s, Southern Methodist University published a study of the tourist court trade in Dallas and reported that more than half of the business done in the local camps was the couple trade. The study's findings were reported with glee in the New Republic, which noted that, quote, the university report says that very few of the women who visit these camps are professional prostitutes. A map of Dallas has been published with dots to indicate the home addresses of the owners of automobiles used in the couple trade, a map the publication of which must have given some Dallas residents heart failure. The map indicates that practically none of the clients is from slums or semi-slums, but on the contrary, comes from the wealthiest sections of the city. Whilst the report noted that, quote, wisely the university presents this information without any emotional colour, simply as a bit of evidence of the changing character of our civilization. Others were not so measured. In 1940, J. Edgar Hoover published an article in American magazine attacking camps of crime. With little evidence, he charged that the majority of camps were dens of vice and corruption, frequented by nomadic prostitutes, hardened criminals, white slavers, and promiscuous college students. The tourist camp industry could do little but continue to condemn such activities and argue that they represented a minority. Many owners did continue to cater to short stop customers, as they were also known, but as long as it was handled discreetly, it did not necessarily deter other customers. The industry publication, Tourist Court Journal, noted that there would always be those interested in the more lurid aspects of any business. Quote, story writers are constantly in search of the new locale for an old plot, and it's flattering to the tourist court that even the best writers are aware of this tremendous industry still in its teens. Indeed, the combination of mobility and anonymity bound up in the tourist court did prove attractive to writers. Tourist courts featured widely in films and literature. For film noir, tourist courts neatly represented the liminality experienced by many of the characters. And on the flip side, their reputation as spaces for social mixing mean they sit well as a thematic backdrop for the travels of the heiress and the journalist in Frank Capra's 1934 It Happened One Night although the risque potential of the space is also present, as you can see. If you've not seen the film, they, uh, they're an unmarried couple who happen to share the room. And so they put up a blanket um, to divide it. Um, but uh, you see the blanket uh, come down, like the walls of Jericho fall, and they, um, there's a tryst. 
1937 novella by crime writer Leslie Ford, that's a pseudonym of Zenith Jones Brown, for example, entitled Death Stops at the Tourist Camp, plays heavily on ideas of identity as the plot hinges on the fact that all the cabins are the same. The heroine is tricked into spending the night in the wrong cabin so a dead body can be left in her actual cabin and thus she, a good little rich girl and daughter of a judge, is framed for murder. Similarly, the idea of things being not what they seem and the difficulty of appraising people in the democratic space of the motel also comes to the fore as many of the guests, in true detective story fashion, have something to hide. Nevertheless, the essential moral goodness of the motel owner, an upright widow in reduced circumstances, and her handsome, hard-working son who finally saved the day, are never in doubt. Thus, whilst the growing financial success of the tourist court business demonstrated that Americans were increasingly comfortable on the road in the 1930s, the creation of these new architectural and social spaces didn't pass without comment. And whilst much of it was favourable, their position as agents and recipients of social change mark them out as potentially destabilizing in ways which make them really rewarding areas for broader cultural analysis. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Looking forward uh, to uh, your questions. And, yes, and, and thank you, Kara. That what pro presentation was absolutely excellent. And in fact, I just got a chat coming out here which says excellent. <laughs> uh, from, thank uh, you. That was top notch. And, you know, it's so interesting because, uh, well, a lot of the comments and, and we'll start going through them are about this couples trade thing. So it just shows that the uh, the viewers of the SCA are just as interested in the lurid <laughs> aspects of the motel trade as uh, everybody else was during those days. I have to say it's it's not just you guys. Uh, it's, a, it's a common topic of the questions. Right. Yes. No, it's very good. So I, I, we do have some comments. Uh, we have about we had twenty four. We have twenty four people watching, which is uh, not bad for a Sunday afternoon. So that it's turned out to be a popular topic. Um, I, I will, I'll start off with. I had a question. It was interesting. In one of the slides you showed, it was an early one, and it was uh, not a photo. It was more like a, a drawing or a painting. And it, it was cabin court. A bunch of men standing around a fire. Um, mm. you know, probably drinking and having fun and carousing. And then women seem to be within the cab, the cabins. Now, the, you know, motels of this era um, try to promote a family atmosphere. You know, they have a swimming mm. pool, playground for the kids and this kind of stuff. But that would seem to indicate that in those days, um, people would they'd get to the court and then the men would hang out and the women would uh, stay behind. I mean, did, you, did your research show anything like that? Yeah, so there's definitely is some of that. And this is the interesting kind of journey from sort of auto camping. So very much a kind of, you know, that sort of round the campfire kind of idea mm -hmm. um, into what we now think of as a more sort of privatized family vacation. Although, as you know, you know, things like swimming pools, obviously, were, were always at communal spaces. Um, so I think that that um, that legacy of camping is is really I think it's really fascinating and that I gave the quote from um, the Norman uh, Hayden oh, and his wife. Um, and they talk about the fact that, you know, that when they're on a camping trip and there's a whole range of different places that they can stay, one of which are basically prototype motels, but they're excited because you get a little stove in the accommodations um, and a bed frame and you could, you could bring your own bedding. And so I think those sort of camping experiences would have looked a, a little bit more like you know a campsite you know there would have been people kind of sitting out in conversation and women would have been doing domestic labor in those spaces so you know mm -hmm. they would have been preparing meals um and doing essentially you know doing housework um and so i think that that yeah that that is very much this kind of transition period where um and and, and early moteliers realized that there was frankly a particularly female public who would appreciate the opportunities to not have to cook for their whole family you know on a small stove in a in a cabin and so you then get um you know cafes attached you know that kinds of things sort of having some space for for food and so that as there's a, as a sort of professionalization of the business goes on um adding sort of yeah catering facilities essentially becomes a kind of popular option and it might just have been that you know the the wife of the family who owns the place would offer to you know to make a meal or you know so it would have yeah, there was a lot of 
a lot of variation but i think that's yeah that's sort of what you see um but yeah the as uh you know the interest in the the kind of more nefarious uses of you know the the tourist courts suggests there was always a fear that you know because of anonymity um you know you could you know you could just step out of your car go and you know get a, you know book a room and you know somebody's hiding in the car to be driven in you know to, <laughs> to use the room at, you know for immoral purposes yes yeah, um, right. and so you know so that's uh yeah that's ever present and i think even i mean even more so i i mean i could have an interesting conversation perhaps you know i'm sure you've got knowledgeable um members on the call but you know how how that changes maybe even more in the 1950s when you get into this the sort of the baby boom era um and into sort of family vacation travel um which has you know all sorts of kind of meanings of sort of national regeneration kind of tied up in it um and you know that that actually some of those anxieties really kind of come through because the business is trying to sort of position itself um in a in a different way um anyway i will i will stop because there's lots of questions <laughs> okay yes there are um we have a question from michael uh Pisno. And uh, Michael's still online. If you, if you want to, uh, to, to chat with uh, Kara, just let me know, Michael. But his question is, several of the signs in the photos have an AAA sign attached to them. When did the AAA start to inspect and review motels? That is an excellent question and one I don't know the answer to. Um, that's really interesting because I would imagine it was possibly quite early because as, you know, the, you know, the fact that when... Um, the the first motel is being developed in California in the early to mid twenties that you know the automobile association of Southern California is you know is kind of incorporated into those conversations so I I would think that because these are facilities really targeted at obviously at motorists that you know that motoring you know organisations would have been interested um, but I don't know for sure that's a really interesting question um, and yes exactly would would make a great a great research project um, and yeah because that's you know you know there's obviously for, for travelers particularly for going long distances there's a lot of anxiety about what you're going to find on the road and the fact that these are all you know individual businesses with very varying qualities obviously some people find that absolutely marvelous and they like the you know the the excitement and the variety but for other travelers that's obviously not great um and they they want some reassurance and so you know those sorts of um those seals of approval from things like um, AAA, but also, um, you know, when you get a little bit further on in years, you get things like the referral networks, which is obviously the earlier precursor of um, of the uh, the big chains. But the referral networks, which would often be, um, you know, might be regional, where you would, you know, you, there would be some sort of standardisation, or at least a, you know. Uh, as the motelier, I'd be able to recommend to you another motel that's, you know, 100, 150 miles down the road that you might want to stay in. And, you know, so there's there's some kind of um, some ways of guiding yourself sort of through these. This hinterland of of, uh, of options. Right. Yes. It's 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 so funny. You're, you're definitely on the same wave, wavelength as our viewers, because one second before you said, that would be a good research project. The, the questioner, Michael Pisno, said, I guess I've got a research project. <laughs> so I, I'm looking you know. forward to hearing, Michael. It would, it would be fascinating. Yes. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to ask a question from Philip Langdon. Uh, he, and of course, uh, obviously from your accent, uh, our viewers can tell that you're, uh, you're uh, English. And uh, he says, did Britain have an equivalent to cottages and motels? That's a good question. And it's really a um, a feature of geography that we don't in the same way. I mean, we do now we have, you know, there are hotels at the at the roadside, um, you know, particularly at as you get in the States now, at, you know, at, at interchanges. But our our sort of lodging traditions are very different. And that's just because we don't have the massive stretches of sort of motorway where you need to find somewhere, you know, or you know, highway to stop. Um, you know, we have a tradition of, um, say, for example, um, pubs offering accommodation. So that would have been the sort of coaching inns of the kind of pre-car era. Um, and those sorts of things would have been what, what people would have looked to um, or accommodations that look more like the, the kind of tourist homes 
uh, of of the US. Um, my understanding, and I'm not um, I'm not expert, but from my from my reading, I do I think that Australia has quite a similar sort of motel culture to the US, and you can see that that there's some very sim there's a lot of similarities there in terms of sort of scale and in terms of um, the ubiquity of sort of car culture. Um, and I think that's an important thing as well that, oh, I'd, I'd, I don't know the stats, but my my guess would be that, you know, that the train network in the UK and car ownership patterns in the 20th century do look different to the to the US. You know, we didn't, um, I always remember this, this is slightly off topic, but it gets the idea. Um, Bill Bryson, the travel writer, um, his first book, or one of his early books where he talks about moving to the, moving to England I guess he's in the 1970s. Um, and he remembers that, you know, his in-laws, um, you know, they'd only actually really recently got a refrigerator, you know, that this, yeah, you know, that obviously was sort of 15 to 20 years after you'd expect that to be a standard piece of kind of consumer equipment in the States. So, you know, there was, yeah, there was a lot of difference, but yeah, the, the kind of the British sort of hotel experience is, yeah, is just different. Okay. Um, Emily has asked a, a couple of questions and particularly referring to the couples trade, but also to the role of women in, in the motel industry. Emily, you're, you're online, I believe. Can you uh, unmute yourself and maybe you could ask your questions directly to, uh, to Cara. Here she sure. Comes. Hello again, Cara. <laughs> um, well, my first question was, did you mentioned that, you know, these were smaller tourist camps and, different from the later mid-century motels that were a little more sleek and modern. Did any of them, uh, were any of them able to transition from the, the old style to the new style to, to stay alive? Do you know if any were able to do that? Yeah. Or could? No, I think, I think many did. I mean, and, and partly you can see that when you look at, you know, kind of, um, you know, things like, motel postcards postcards from you know the 50s and 60s you know, there's several places that look older I mean and also you know you think of it with um some of the because I, I was talking a lot about kind of folksy and sort of historic associations in kind of design but you did also get you know motels in the 30s which really went with a sort of modern style you know the kind of art deco moderns yeah. sort of sleek um and lots of those did survive. I mean, as I said, one of the features of these businesses, though, was that often that there was, you know, that there was remodeling, that there was rebuilding, um, and that was quite uh, practical. Um, but then, obviously, you get the changes that happen in the in the nineteen fifties, particularly with, as uh, your members will all know, the you know the interstate system developing and the 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 smaller you know, well the highway network, which obviously in lots of places was. Um, was free access. The interstate system obviously brings in um, limited access. So you, you know, so that you all know this, but the, you know, the land becomes more valuable at the interchanges because that's the only place that motorists can really get on and off. And, you know, that, that kind of the value that, that it becomes so much more expensive to get into the business. So you then you have different financing models, you have chain operations. Um, and so you get what are the, um, uh, you know, J. Cole and, and other sort of motel scholars kind of call, call the sort of the, mo you know, the, the motorway hotel, you know, the highway hotel. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of swing back a bit, actually, to sort of older forms of lodging, which become the only way to really make enough money to, to, to sort of service the, the kind of the, the highway landscape, really, that opens up in the, through the sort of interstates in the 50s and 60s. So, um, yeah, so that's to say that lots of the older properties, um, I mean, what often happens is that they just slide down the scale. They, you know, they're still there, but they are cheaper. Um, you know, there's actually going back to Bill Bryson. He probably tells one of my <laughs> one of my favorite authors, but he's always very he's very good at um, yeah, he's he's just very descriptive. Um, he, you know, he has some wonderful descriptions of kind of being a kid and traveling, um, you know, sort of fifties America, sort of through these motels. Obviously, you know, the the you hope to stay in a lovely kind of glass plated, you know. <laughs> all singing and dancing modern one but actually you know you end up staying in something that looks like a serial killer's in the next room um <laughs> and, you know so that so i think that you know as is often the case it's like you know when we think about things like fashion history you know i think in 1964 not everybody was wearing clothes 
from 1964. Lots of people were wearing clothes from five years before or 10 years before, you know, that actually, so lots of, you know, lots of these spaces persist, um, but, you know, they may be, they may be kind of changing their position on the, on the kind of um, economic scale. Right. That That's good. That's really interesting. And, and I, I know you think, oh, well, we know this stuff, but, you know, sometimes our group gets so excited about how nice the sign is and how cool the building is, is that we don't take the time to step back and be like, why did these, you know, why did these last? Why did these one at the, these hotels at this interchange last? And, you know, it's nice to hear your presentation and hear you talk and, you know, kind of step back and say, well, because this is why, and it was harder for the ones that were off and, you know, off yeah. of well, and I would definitely encourage you all, you know, when you are thinking about these spaces that have survived to, to, to do exactly that, to think about why they have. And, you know, there's lots of interesting. I was reading something recently about, God, I think it was in New Orleans, a sort of 50s era, maybe sort of early 60s era motel that had survived in a in a slightly kind of not particularly desirable neighborhood, essentially. And I was thinking that that's the exact that that's basically the reason it survived is because nobody wanted the space. You know, it wasn't getting bulldozed to put up a new, you know, whatever. It it just persisted because you know, but as partly as a result, result of where it was and the fact you know and the, the article was about the fact that it had been kind of seized by hipsters and redone redone as a kind of trendy kind of boutique hotel. But yeah, but exactly that. I was really interested into you know why yeah why does it make it through sort of sixty odd years. To still be there so yeah it's definitely yeah, it's a good point it's always good to to think of that because it really gives you a sense of kind of why what changes were happening in the landscape what changes were happening in the community you know why yeah just why so it's a good it's a good point awesome thank you there's a um a, the research project has already started there's quite a bit in the chat now about aaa and when it started and when they started their inspections and so on so we've got some basic information already um, Ron uh, Laducer says, while the low capital investment requirements, you talked about this, allowed the owner operators to build and improve the motels during the, the depression, he says, I've heard that the same economic conditions dis disfavored chain motel development. Would, would you say that it was a, a true statement? Um, thinking specifically about this period. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, obviously, there were examples of attempts to develop chains um, in this period. But that, yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. And and I'd have to give it some thought. I have come across it, but I just not not for a little while about kind of why. I suppose some of it is to do with the fact that if you had low sort of startup costs, often say because you already owned some land or, you know, that that you know, often so often farmers, you know, whose whose land abutted a highway, it was very easy for them to just, you know, sure. throw up some cabins the first year and then throw up a few more the next year, you know. Whereas I I suspect that if you were, you know, perhaps trying to kind of finance a a more elaborate model, I think particularly when the industry was was in quite a testing phase, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's like I said, you know, we think of this as a very clean line from, you know, camps to the courts to sort of you know through to motels but but obviously you know perhaps in a in a period of difficult um difficult economic circumstances I mean as the Pierce example that I showed you the Pierce pennant which I just love and I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't include more photos because there's some really the, like the crazy ladies bathrooms are just amazing um but you know that incredibly kind of you know luxurious approach which obviously you know figured that all people driving were always going to be upper class and rich and have chauffeurs. Um, you know, that just did not work. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a period that was that was suitable for that kind of business. And so I do suspect that there was, you know, that it just was it was difficult to be kind of investing at a large scale. Um, and I think by the time you then get into the sort of successful chains of the late 50s, you think about Holiday Inn um, and onwards, you know, that's there's so much more standardization has happened in the industry the in you know small small owned operators have basically worked out a lot of the kinks um and you know basically the you know the the chain operators realize that you know standardized pricing standardized offer 
actually people are, are really ready for that and you know that the, you can that you have also you know kind of national networks for advertising and all these other things so yeah it's, it's interesting to think about what you know why sort of you need that sort of 30 years to elapse well that's 20 25 years to elapse before you can kind of get to that much larger model uh, that's very interesting um I just want to mention to everybody, uh, we're actually reaching the end of our, our time. So I'll just mention to everybody that uh, Dr. Rodway has also published, a, she has another um, uh, article or, or dissertation or whatever out on, uh, and actually Emily put the name here. Oh yeah. Um, titled Managing Quasi-Domesticity at the Roadside Post-War Female Moteliers and the Space of Reinvention. And based on what you've on, on the quality of this presentation we just gave, I think that would be a, a wonderful one as a follow up, maybe sometime next year in in uh, nineteen in twenty twenty four. That's it. Oh, well, that that would, I would I would love to come back and share that with you. I love my female moteliers um, and their memoirs, so I would yeah I would happily happily come and share them with you. Great. Well, that's uh, we're going to put that on the list, and uh, we'll be in touch. Don't worry, it is because that it does sound like a very interesting uh, a topic to talk about. And I know our group would be really interested in that one too. Now, I, I'm not gonna take any more questions, but there's lots of comments here too for you and, and, and particularly a lot of very nice compliments, which you will receive, Kara. Uh, but I'm going to, because we're, we're past our time now. So I'm going to end it off by again, thanking you very much for taking your time and effort on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening in England. To, um, to speak to our group. And I know everybody found it fascinating, as, as did I. I love your pictures, too. And I will say, I've seen a hundred presentations about motels and the origin of that, that industry, but I have never seen mentioned or discussed or a picture of this couples only concept. I mean, that's a bit taboo, I guess. And uh, to the fact that you included that was fascinating and, and very interesting. Well, if you, if, if you have me back to talk about the female moteliers, I promise an extended section about the uh, the hot pillow trade. Is, is also <laughs> yeah, that's cool. great. Okay, just like to remind everyone uh, about next month, uh, when on Wednesday, uh, November the 15th, at our usual time of 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, we will join Marissa Scheinfeld, uh, who's the author of The Borscht Belt, revisiting the remnants of America's Jewish vacation land for an illustrated lecture with photographs of abandoned sites where resorts, hotels, and bungalow colonies once boomed in the Catskill Mountain region of upstate New York. Now, SCA members will be receiving the relevant details and registration link by email. And if anybody else is interested, all they need to do is go to our website and uh, they can register directly through there. So thanks everybody for taking your Sunday afternoons and for Kara taking your Sunday evening to spend some time with us. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the SCA, you can expect to get a, a email uh, probably today or tomorrow, uh, inviting you to join if you're interested and you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody as well that the uh, recording of this presentation and the Q&A will be up on our website probably tomorrow. And so tell your friends and neighbors and colleagues if they missed it, they'll still have a chance to to, uh, to uh, view the presentation. Uh, Carrie, did you have any last words for us? No, I just want to say thank you very much to everyone for your time and for your excellent questions um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Okay, thank you. And with that, I will bid everyone a, a good afternoon and to care a good night. And we hope to see everyone next, next month. Good night.